Hello everyone, Brandon Morrison, PsyD student in California, here to talk about the categorical versus dimensional models of diagnosis and some of the issues and debates around the current structure of the Diagnostical Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, 5th edition. Well, here in the year 2019, we have the DSM-5. And currently, there is a large debate between practitioners in the psychiatric and psychological fields about how we categorize and how we um, therefore treat and diagnose and come up with differences in observations of people. So to put it a little more clearly, uh, studying, studying something like personality disorders can be a little bit tricky because who are we to say just as clinicians that something is disordered or normal and how do we determine that? Well, in order to determine that, it's helpful to have a reference group. So comparing one thing to another to see the difference in, okay, this seems like it's going well, this seems fairly normal, and this other thing over here seems starkly different. That's called discriminant validity. Um, the field of personality research doesn't have much discriminant validity as to date. Of course, you can find some, check, do your own research. However, strong, strong, strong discriminant validity is not where it needs to be in personality research. And as such, some psychologists propose and researchers have been trying to get the field to shift more toward research focus of um, normative data, that is comparing two groups and trying to see diversity. Therefore, this group is called the, the dimensional group. They, they are on the side of, hey, categories could be a bad, a bad way to go about this whole thing of personality. For instance, if you have borderline personality disorder, you need to have nine criteria uh, in order, there are nine possible ways you can have symptoms or behaviors that show up that the clinician would look for. And then out of the nine, you would need to meet five of those in order to fall into the category of borderline personality disorder. Therefore, what do we do with individuals when they have four symptoms? What do you do with individuals when they have nine symptoms but everything seems to be going just fine to them. Um, they, don't, they don't notice any uh, problems between people interpersonally or any problems in themselves. They don't feel uncomfortable from, from it intrapersonally. So who are we to say that just because you have nine symptoms that you have this uh, disorder when indeed nothing's going wrong intrapersonally or interpersonally? And then the person with four symptoms that might be highly disturbed um, themselves um, having suicide attempts or uh, chaotic relationships but oh no they only have four symptoms so they don't get this diagnosis and then therefore they do not get any treatment that is attached to the diagnosis as today we have uh, dialectical behavioral therapy which has been shown to be an effective treatment for uh, borderline personality disorder with suicidality in a variety of contexts including substance use and eating disorders um, but you see how it's hard to get the research and the treatment to the group when you have difficulty defining the group in the first place. So the debate, in order to, for the sake of time, I'll go over some pros and cons of the category model. So placing them in categories, categorical. You can think about it discrete because you're either in this category or you're not in this category, sort of black and white, like four to five, now you're in the category as with the example of BPD. So we'll communicate the categorical model, some pros of it, some cons of it, and then we'll jump into the dimensional model of pros and cons. Okay, so the debate for the, the making the case for the categorical model um, is that first of all, the DSM does not have a categorical model right now. It is in a hybrid model because traits are on a continuum in a way, meaning that hey, you have nine, you can have any combination of the nine. Um, so there's some flexibility there, sort of a continuum, um, not just you have it or you don't. So we'll call it a hybrid model. Uh, but it has had to make the shift into this hybrid model in the first place. Mind you, the DSM is in the fifth edition currently. Therefore, you can see that it wasn't always this way. However, with this categorical model, you get the benefit of communication between practitioners hey, it's borderline personality disorder, and then the clinician can think, hmm, these nine things are in my mind. This is what the client might be suffering um, from or problems that they might be having. 
So improved lexicon among practitioners. Um, another benefit is the hybrid nature that you can have different combinations and you can still communicate between providers that, yeah, I, I understand what, what might be going on. Um, some cons of the categorical model. One could be the ambiguity of hybrids. It's a little bit ambiguous because, for instance, something like depression, I know we're, we're talking about personality disorders in this video, but something like depression shows up in double-digit um, combinations. You, you've done combinations and permutations in school. Uh, you can see how depression can get kind of complicated and nuanced when, what are we talking about? We're we talking about they, the client does not want to leave their house. Are we talking about the client um, feels despair or has some agitation in their body, depressive thoughts? Um, what is it, interpersonal? Uh, it can show up in so many different ways. So that's, that's the con of the categorical model. Another con of the categorical model is the reference group that we mentioned in the beginning of the video. Um, if you don't have a reference group and you only study pathology as pathology rather than comparing it to what could be considered normal, it gets a little bit complicated. Uh, so then the, the pros of the dimensional model would be that there is a research base. Uh, the, the research is proposing dimensionality or a, a continuous spectrum of personality diversity and want to define it in a way that makes it so you have the reference group. They're not just talking the talk, but they're trying to walk the walk. And as such, they are using evidence-based literature on what we do know about personality so far. So what we do know is the OCEAN model. That, that's one of the more, more popular frameworks in the field, which stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. You can find a myriad literature on that. And examples of how the dimensional model incorporates OCEAN or the basic characteristics that uh, most people share in personality, or they, the researcher re would put a trait up. It's called the trait model. The dimensional model is also called the trait model. Um, you put the trait up, so for instance, openness, or uh, what, let's, do, let's do agreeableness right here since I have the page marked. So agreeableness is a trait on the ocean model, but what's the opposite pole of agreeableness would be antagonism. So clearly antagonistic rather than agreeable. And then you have two poles. And depending on where you fall on the polarity, it could become dysfunctional because too little of something could be a bad thing and too much of something could be a bad thing. And we know that about many things in life, not just personality. So this, this trait model has, has some has some potential just in the in the realm that it would have a normative reference group. This trait model is also found in, in page 779 of the DSM uh, fifth edition. You could there's two parts to this trait model, and it's the level of personality functioning scale. So LPFS for short uh, shows two criterion for uh, disorders as they would can be propagated to be. One criteria would be, is this impairing myself or is this impairing my relationships, interpersonal or in intrapersonal? So, and then from there, what's impairing about it? And then you have the scales that we just mentioned, negative affect versus emotional stability, detachment versus extroversion, um, and antagonism, agreeableness, disinhib disinhibition, uh, kind of like impulsivity or conscientiousness uh, and the psychoticism and lucidity. So more more normalized in a sense. Then those are the pros for the dimensional. Some cons for the dimensional are how are we going to treat something if we don't really know where it came from? Uh, this is the etiological debate. This This part gets complicated with almost any construct in psychology, however, because psychology Psychology deals with complex variables that are continuous because you have human beings and therefore it's not, nothing's going to be clear cut. You are going to be hard pressed to find, uh, correl you're going to be hard pressed to find causality in anything you study in the social sciences. And that's what's, what makes this field of science particularly challenging and interesting. You can find strong evidence to say this causes this. 
but more more than like more often than not you're going to find high correlation that might make you think it's causal therefore the dimensional model has the vulnerability of the etiological debate of you don't know where it stems from this is just another theory and in a sense that's true it is another theory is it a more accurate theory is it a more helpful theory that's what the debate seeks to find another con of the dimensional model is the uh the finding of extra domains in personality. Ocean might not cover it all, and how do we know if it covers it all? That uh, ocean has been used highly in the United States, and it's been used worldwide as well. However, researchers in non-United States cultures have found another dimension um, stemming from something we call the dark triad. The dark triad is a cluster of three, three behaviors off the top of my head, I'm not exactly sure what they are. Machiavellianism, um, and then narcissism, and one more thing, but maybe psychoticism. All three of those things are called the dark triad, making someone, uh, obviously the word dark is used, I, I don't want to speak pejoratively, but character traits that are um, less, less wanted, seen as less functional in society, and in order to explain the dark triad, the researchers from non-U.S. cultures explained that you could put another scale up of honesty versus uh, deceitfulness. Uh, so, are you honest or are you deceitful, and where where is the uh, the variety? I guess the variability from person to person, because that's something that will have to be addressed too. So. Just, just one example right there. If we don't even have all the facts straight, how are we going to adopt a new model? Um, is it is it better to try and figure out along the way, as you know, addition upon addition has uh, sought to do? What are we going to do with all the research that we already have that considered the categorical model? Categorical model is it going to transfer, or do we have to throw away data from years and years and years? Uh, it's a sticky situation. So. You'll have to do your due, due, due diligence and decide for yourself. And I hope that this video at least catalyzed some food for thought and that you can do the research and uh, come up with your own opinion. Thank you very much. Brandon Morrison, California, Saidi.